Hello everybody, I hope you're fine. So this is a little inconspicuous video I'm dropping here and it is a continuation of uh, or a reaction to a idea to another video uh, recorded by Jeff and I will put his uh, original clip um, in the description below and uh, the concept is uh, albums that deserve to be called transitional a lot of bands uh, have changed their style over the years and uh, sometimes it comes abrupt but a lot of times there is uh, this unique kind of album that is neither here nor there and uh, that kind of bridges these two styles and can uh, rightly so be called transitional. So I've picked five records and um, I've put them in a certain order starting with those cases that are rather obvious and do not need that much uh, of explanation and working my way through to those rather more complicated ones. So let's begin with this record here that I uh, would certainly um, describe as transitional. I'm talking about Circle of Love by Steve Miller Band. Now, uh, Steve Miller Band, very successful American group in the 70s and also a very successful group in the 80s. Now, this record here is uh, quite interesting because uh, it uh, is not only transitional, but um, it is uh, set up in a way where the A-side quite strongly reflects the previous era, while the B-side is fully dedicated to those things uh, that are to come. This is not a particularly popular Steve Miller Band album, but I actually quite like it. I mean, the band had a lot of success prior to that in the late 70s um, with these two records. Fly Like an Eagle and, of course, um, Book of Dreams. A um, lot of hits there, a lot of platinum. Now, after that, Steve Miller did not record an album for almost two years. I have no idea for what reasons, but uh, then suddenly the band appeared with this record entering the 80s. Of course, this record is famous for, for its B-side that has only one track on it, uh, the infamous Macho City. Um, which people don't particularly like, but I think it's a great track and uh, actually this is a strong contender for me to uh, use it in my uh, Breaking the Lands video because um, I think this is a good album, uh, but uh, not everybody thinks so. The next album on my list is a rather popular example of the idea of a transitional album and I'm pretty sure it had been called that by many people before me. I'm talking about Shamao by Gong. Now Gong had these two existences in the 70s. First there is this original Gong of David Allen, uh, which is this hilarious, completely outlandish, psychedelic rock band with subversive humor and uh, intense instrumentals and uh, very much a psychedelic rock group with all kind of progressive rock tendencies and then it rather quickly turned into this tight mostly french uh, jazz fusion project more or less instrumental most of the time with some amazing musicians on board ranging from uh, mick taylor to alan holdsworth to mike oldfield um, but at the same time, most of the guys on board here were rather identical with those guys that uh, did the previous gong with David Allen. So uh, this record here is indeed something in between. It still carries forward a lot of the uh, psychedelic aesthetic uh, of the previous records and uh, certain elements of... Uh, ethnographical music uh, put into the mix uh, while at the same time it uh, completely lacks all of this uh, quirky David Allen type of humor. It is still called Gong but um, to some extent this is already a test run for the Pierre Morlin Gong uh, 
So it's an interesting bridge between two completely different uh, states of mind. The third album is another strong example of an album that is a transition between two completely different uh, musical styles and uh, is one of those albums that had been talked to death uh, over this issue. I'm talking about A by Jethro Tull. Another case of a band entering the 80s. Um, now this transition, transitional album was probably not intended to be one. Um, it's a well-known well story that this was supposed to be a, the first solo album by the frontman Ian Anderson and not a Jethro Tull album and uh, that's kind of where everything started to go wrong because uh, Chrysalis, the label, uh, really put in a lot of energy to convince him to give in and to call it a Jethro Tull album. Um, so Anderson gave in and called this a Jethro Tull album, which was a bit of a problem because um, most of the musicians he surrounded himself here were not of the old guard and uh, after this basically became the template for the new Jethro Tull. Um, a huge wave of firing of musicians <laughs> followed. Now Jethro Tull always uh, worked through certain phases in their history and their style always changed after three to four albums. Before A, of course, uh, they made these two records, Heavy Horses and Stormwatch, um, and uh, those were kind of this mixture of uh, uh, stomping folk rock combined with some heavy hard rock riffs. But of course their presence in the 80s is much more known for a certain rather electronic style of music and uh, even a little bit of radio-friendly aesthetic. But interestingly this is the album that stands in between and that still echoes a little bit um, the rather groovy vibe of the 70s uh, with the strong electric guitar touch, uh, but at the same time, um, particularly with uh, Eddie Jobson on board, uh, it's, a, it's a very kind of keyboard and electronica heavy album. And um, for that it was uh, criticized by many, but I, th I still think this is an outstanding record and uh, it sounds beautiful and uh, it has some great tracks on it, particularly the A-side is very strong. So I never had a problem with this record. Um, I think it's a very strong one. The next album in my list is Spleen and Ideal by Dead Can Dance. At this point in time Dead Can Dance had already recorded one and a half albums. Um, their debut album self-titled and um, quickly followed with The Garden of the Arcane Delights which was an EP. And up until that point, uh, Dead Can Dance was a rather one of those rather typical 4AD bands, together in a circle of groups like Cocteau Twins and This Mortal Coil. Those are all bands that kind of supported each other, because they had a very similar, uh, kind of very re reverb strong um, sound um, with a certain raw aesthetic that was in sync uh, with uh, the new wave uh, music of the 80s. And uh, this was about to change for Dead Can Dance. And uh, they were to become, um, for example, on the next album, uh, Within the Realm of a Dying Sun, they were to become this very idiosyncratic, uh, ethereal, band whose music uh, did lend itself well to soundtracks and that was very kind of symphonic and very uh, mysterious and very um, soft-spoken most of the time. This album here is very different from their first album, but it's true that Spleen and Ideal, which is the album between those two, um, is a type of transitional album between these two phases of this band uh, where you can still hear a lot of uh, post-punk type of compositions and, and arrangements uh, still using conventional rock instruments like bass guitar and guitar and, uh, and, and drums, rock drums, even though used of course uh, in, a, in their own peculiar way. But you have already 
tracks on this album that are arranged with more classical instruments and uh, ethnographic instruments and natural instruments of all kinds. This record um, has still a bit of their first musical chapter while already strongly foreboding uh, those records that are to come in the following five and six years. Yeah, so that's the case of Dead Can Dance, Spleen, an ideal, wonderful album, one of my favorite album covers of all times. And um, yeah, great example of 4AD music. The last one is a bit tricky. I'm talking about the 1996 album Smoochie by Ryuichi Sakamoto. And um, that's kind of interesting uh, trajectory that uh, his uh, music was taking. In the 80s and deeply into the 90s, Ryuichi Sakamoto was this superstar in Japan, producing mainly uh, very successful pop records and even more successful film soundtracks. Even got an Oscar for The Last Emperor together with David Byrne. And uh, his music, particularly in the 80s, was this very opulent uh, city pop sound combined with jazz and swing. And uh, he was very famous for having tons of guest musicians on his records from the whole world. Uh, he had always this vision of uh, that's what he called the Neo Geo band, this vision of creating a network of musicians that he could always tap into and uh, that uh, could deliver the parts that he needed. Now his music, most of the time, very romantic, very upbeat, uh, very funky, uh, very jazzy when he needed to, always kind of tapping into uh, the zeitgeist of music at this point in time, working with DJs and whatever crossed his mind. Um, when he did Smoochie, something significantly changed actually, because uh, while this is still a pop album to some extent, it does not have this kind of glamour and uh, this kind of glorious city pop atmosphere of, his, of many of his previous records. Um, it's strangely introspective. It has this underlying degree of melancholy and uh, it's almost filled with a strange existential sadness, almost like it's oozing a feeling of mortality and, uh, and vanitas. It kind of sets a mark for his music that from now on um, started to go through a constant uh, whirlwind of changes. I mean, for a long time he worked only on the piano and then he uh, worked with a acoustic trio, with a cello, and so on. So, um, while Sakamoto's uh, musical path is difficult to describe with only a few words in only a minute or two, um, it always seemed to me that this album here um, has this transitional quality from uh, this rather uh, glamorous, upbeat, uh, funky musician from Tokyo to this rather thoughtful, highly melancholic, um, almost almost uh, immersed in a strange sadness uh, type of artist, you know. And um, so it's it's a very it's a very I mean this album flows beautifully. It's quite strong compositionally, and um, it's still a pop record, but it certainly starts something that uh, wasn't over that soon and. You can um, observe this in many of his other following records, like Chasm. And uh, it's suddenly an artist that is more mature, that is more seasoned, and that is suddenly more thoughtful, more engaged with uh, the problems of uh, the human race, and, uh, and generally more introspective. So that's it. Those were five albums that I perceive as transitional. And um, with that, I will leave you and uh, wish you a wonderful day. Goodbye.